That's great, thank you. Oh, it's so good to be back. I was going to introduce myself after Andy's introduction as I'm Andy Clark, one of the leaders of this of St John's. I was going to introduce myself today. It's good morning, I'm Keith Short. I'm not one of the leaders at St John's. So is that Mike all right, Andy, or is it just do you need to get closer to it? Oh, that just cramps my style. November the 16th, 2021 is a day that is etched in my mind. It's not just because it's the day that I stopped leading or, stopped or came off the payroll at St. John's. It's because at 6.30 that morning, I was in a car making a journey, a, 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 an hour-long journey to a hospital to have a hip replacement operation. Now, I'm a bit of a wuss, actually. I'm, you know, I... I I don't like pain. I don't like doctors. Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 it, it, the whole hospital scene, it, it brings me out in cold sweat. I'm not a mighty man of faith and power when it comes to the National Health Service. So I, the, my anxiety levels were quite high as I was travelling into hospital that morning to have my hip replaced. They weren't helped, however, by the Norwich but I thought that uh, you had an epidural or, or a spinal block to, to numb your back and you're just sedated, you're not given a general anaesthetic. Now, my anxiety levels were not helped by my daughter telling me, yes, yeah, she had had one when she was giving birth and it didn't work. <laughs> Nor were my anxiety levels helped by my friend Grant, who, who'd had a hip replacement, telling me, oh yeah, it didn't work. I woke up halfway through the procedure to see the surgeon with a mallet whacking something into my hip. So you can, you can understand some degree of anxiety on my heart. You know, I, I'm not that much sure. Anyway, so I went in. I, I was informed by the anaesthetist that it actually wasn't an epidural. It was a spinal block and I'd be fine because I'd, I'd sort of shared my fear with him. And then they came to the time to sedate me. And I remember clearly saying to the nurse, excuse me, I don't think this sedation's worked. And she said, what do you mean? You've had your operation. <laughs> <laughs> now that is absolutely nothing compared to what Jesus must have felt as he entered Jerusalem. And uh, we read in Isaiah 50, verse 7, that he set his face like flint. Jesus modelled obedience. And we know that it wasn't easy for Jesus. We know that uh, he had far more reason to be anxious than I did going into hospital. Because there in the Garden of Gethsemane, we read that he was in anguish. If it's possible, God, will you take this cup from me? <coughs> so Jesus was not looking forward to this, but was determined in obedience to God to go up from Jericho to Jerusalem to meet what would be a horrible death. It must have been surreal for him. As there he was, riding on this colt, or as John's Gospel tells us, a donkey, into Jerusalem, and the crowds were cutting down branches and, and throwing their coats in, in, in the road and saying, Hosanna! Welcome to the Son of David! Those same crowds that just a few days later would be crying out for his blood and shouting, crucify him, crucify him. This Jesus who would bring freedom and hope, but not the freedom that they were expecting. This wasn't the Jesus they were expecting. They weren't expecting a Jesus that was going to come to Jerusalem and get crucified. They are expecting a Jesus that would come to Jerusalem and overthrow the Roman, um, uh, the Roman occupiers and bring freedom to their nation. We don't always get the Jesus we want. 
I love Narnia stories, you know, I'm, I'm a big kid. I, I was talking to my 60-year-old grandson the other day, and I was, I was actually talking about when we first had children and, and when uh, Peter, our first son, was born, and I said, you know, when Uncle Peter was born, I suddenly realised I had to grow up. And he said, what do you mean, Grandpa? You haven't grown up yet. You know, so, um, but I love Narnia stories. And, and several times, both in the Dawn Treader and, and, and we see, see in the line, The Witch in the Wardrobe, uh, the interaction with Lucy, she's told that, of course, Aslan, who represents Christ, is not a tame lion. He doesn't do what we expect. He doesn't come to us on our terms. I want to take us back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, to Luke chapter 5. And there at the start of Luke chapter 5, I won't read it to you because I need to, to, to race through it, but there at the start of Luke chapter 5, we see at the start of Jesus' ministry, just as he was about to call uh, Peter and, uh, and James and John, uh, at the start of his ministry there, we see that the crowds were pressing in on him. Jesus knew what it was to be under pressure. It's a great comfort to me, you know, to know that we've got a God that knows what pressure we're under. Whatever pressure you're under this morning, you've got a God in heaven that knows it and that cares about it and has experienced it. And then he says to these guys, he's in the boat teaching the crowd, he says to the fishermen, push out into deeper water and let down your net nets for a catch of fish. And, uh, you know, I, I guess their response could have been really interesting. That, you know, come on, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. We've done it all before, it doesn't work. And I want to notice that this encounter with Jesus happened at their place of work. They were fishermen, this was at their business. We expect to encounter Jesus in church, don't we? But more often, most often in the New Testament, most often in my experience, we encounter Jesus outside the walls of these churches. Do you expect to encounter Jesus in your workplace? But the interesting thing to these disciples, they, they, they didn't say, oh, we've done it all before, it doesn't work, or we've never done it like this before, because, you know, it, when you're fishing on Ganassara, you, you, you fish at night, when the fish are near the surface, not in the daytime when they're, when they're down deep. But they said this. If you say so, we'll do it. If you say so, we'll do it. Notice Jesus going to Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday that we're recommending, going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover to his certain death, was walking in obedience to God. And here we see the theme again. The disciples uh, saying, if you say so, we'll do it. And notice that obedience for them was hard. They'd worked hard all night. It was inconvenient. It didn't actually fit. What they, I guess if I'd have been them fishing all night, what I'd have wanted to do is go and have my breakfast and get to bed. But no, they were determined that they were going to be obedient, even if it was inconvenient. <coughs> Jesus rode into Jerusalem knowing he was going to die. What an example. And as we know, they, they let down their nets and they caught a huge catch of fish. So much so that the boats began to sink and they shouted to their friends in the other boats, hey, come and help us. And their friends might, might have been, you know, their competitors in business, but they, they shouted to their friends, come and help us. They cried out for help. At uh, last week's network conference up in Inverness, um, we had one of the, the leader of Pioneer um, uh, UK there, Ness Wilson, and she was speaking, she was absolutely brilliant. In fact, she was speaking in the session before Catherine, Heather, Stuart and I were going to be interviewed. And, uh, and Catherine said to me, oh, I wish we could have had somebody rubbish up and speak before. <laughs> it would have made us look good. But she was absolutely brilliant. But one of the things that Ness said was this, that we're all created with a lack. We need one another. We need others. It's incidentally why St. John's is part of the Scottish Network of Churches because uh, I don't believe there's any such thing as an independent church. 
I think we're interdependent. We need one another. I, I don't believe there's any such thing as an independent Christian. We're interdependent. We need one another. We were, all, we were created for community. We were created with a lack because we need one another. I need you and, and you need me. You've got strengths and gifts that I don't have. Especially when I'm under pressure. The boats began to sink. The crowds, as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, were crying out, Hosanna, which literally from Psalm 18 means the Lord, Lord save us. Lord save us. Lord save us from being selfish. Lord save us from a private faith. Lord save us. But Jesus, it seems to me, is not so impressed with the crowds, although throughout his ministry, crowds were pressing in on him. I want the juxtaposition here to see this. Jesus speaks to individuals. Jesus cares about you. He cares about the individuals. Individuals are important to him. You are important to him. After they'd caught this great catch a fish in Luke chapter 5 verse 8. Peter falls down on his knees in front of Jesus and says, depart from me. I'm not worthy. Get away from me. I'm a sinful man. For many of us, when we know and experience the presence of Jesus, we become aware of our own sin. For many of us, when we let ourselves down and let God down, one of the things we do in our shame is push Jesus away. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Others, like blind Bartimaeus, in Mark chapter 10, just a chapter before the one that we're looking at here, blind Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, here it is again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He knew he had need, and he cried out to Jesus in his blindness, in his lack, and said, I need you. He didn't push Jesus away, he cried out all the more, Jesus, have mercy on me. How will you? How do you respond to Jesus? Yeah, it's great when things are going well. How do you respond when you're under pressure? When he asks you to do something? I used to, I look at the size of me, you wouldn't think so. I used to play rugby. I played for the school uh, first 15, and I played in the Navy, I played for my division uh, in the Navy uh, for, for a while and, until I got injured. And uh, I love rugby. And it's a great thrill of my life to have <laughs> two grandsons that are playing rugby. Ethan, who plays for uh, Linlithgow, uh, here, here in Linlithgow, uh, and my, son, uh, my other grandson, Daniel, who <coughs> plays for Alan Glenn's rugby club in, in Bishop Briggs. And uh, we were through in Bishop Briggs uh, one Sunday, and, and Sunday afternoon, um, Daniel had a rugby match, and uh, so he went off to church straight away afterwards. We stayed on talking, and, and I'm, I'm Heidi, my daughter, and I were going to go and watch Daniel play rugby. We, you know, just so proud of Grandpa, you know, great. And so when we got there, we were a bit late because of church, but all, all, both teams were already out on the pitch, warmed up, so you've got 30 lads, uh, plus substitutes out on the pitch, warming up. Loads of parents and relatives there. I, I was surprised at how many people were there. But, but it was interesting to know, what, what was Daniel doing on the, on the pitch? As soon as I got there, I, 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 what did Heidi and I do? We were scanning, all, all, you know, we, we weren't interested in the other 29 lads that were. We wanted to see Daniel, where's Daniel? But what was Daniel doing? It was interesting, as soon as we caught eyes, we saw him scanning the crowds. Where's my grandpa, where's my mum? And of course, when our eyes met, you saw a smile. Well, a smile came on my face, and a smile came on his face. Because that's what we do when we love someone. 
when we care about them. We want them to see us, and we want to be seen by them. You see, what Peter didn't understand, and what blind Bartimaeus came to understand, was that Jesus cares about you. He's looking for you. Not to trip you up and say, oh, you're miserable, so get me again, I'm going to punish you. Not at all. He's looking for you because he loves you. He longs for you to meet his eyes and to look for him. That's his heart. That's the heart of the Jesus that was riding into Jerusalem in obedience. Luke chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. Jesus says to Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. I love this. What did they do? They left everything, everything, and followed him. They left everything and followed him. In Mark 10, the same chapters we find blind Bartimaeus, we find the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. And Jesus said, this one thing you lack, the thing that's stopping you from going deeper, this stopping you is your wealth. Because he was a very rich man. And Jesus said, Look, give it all away and come follow me. And we read that he went away sad. But the disciples left everything and followed him. You see, what this passage is all about for me is obedience and obedience is sacrifice. We see Jesus modeling obedience because of his love for us as he goes into Jerusalem with the crowds shouting Hosanna, the same crowds that a few days later were going to cry crucify him because public opinion can be very fickle, can't it? Tom Wright writes this in his commentary on the triumphal entry. But the passage already raises questions for us in our own following of Jesus and loyalty to him. Are we ready to put our property at his disposal, to obey his orders, even when they puzzle us? Are we ready to go out of the way to honour him, finding in our own lives the equivalent of cloaks to spread on the road before him and branches to wave to make, to mark, to make his coming into a real festival? Or have we so domesticated and trivialised our Christian commitment, our devotion to Jesus himself, that we look on him simply as someone to help us through the various things we want to do, the various things we want to do anyway, someone to provide us with a comforting religious experience. The rich young ruler went away sad because he couldn't face the cost of following Jesus. Peter and the disciples left everything and followed him. Sure, they still messed up. They sure, they sure did mess up. And I love Peter, actually. I love the story of Peter. If you read Peter's story from the New Testament, you see time and time again, he gets it wrong. He's always putting his foot in his mouth. He's always getting it wrong. Even to denying and cursing Jesus while he's been interrogated in the courts. Peter messed up completely. But Jesus still used him. Jesus still forgave him. Jesus still said of him, upon this rock, I will build my church. It didn't disqualify him, it qualified him. So if obedience is sacrifice, obedience is also persistence. It's persistence. It's keep on going. It's not giving up. What about you this morning? Are you prepared to step out of the crowd to follow Jesus? The cost 
of discipleship is high. It's inconvenient. It's not always logic. But are you prepared to pay that cost to be obedient to Jesus? You see, I believe that becoming a Christian isn't a one-off decision that we make. I think we, have as evangelicals, have done a great disservice to people by majoring on that one prayer of commitment. Now, I'm not saying that's not important. There is a point in my life where I made a commitment to follow Jesus. I have never regretted it. But what I've discovered, just like Peter, just like blind Bartimaeus, and actually we know that blind Bartimaeus was, um, w w was, was part of the early church because Richard Borkman, who's a brilliant work, work about 10 years ago, pointed out that if somebody's named in the New Testament, it means that they were known, they were part of the church. So not only was blind Bartimaeus part of the church, but son of Jairus, so was his dad. The rich young ruler is not named. Are you prepared to step out from the crowd this morning? Are you prepared to take that step of obedience, even if it's inconvenient? To daily take up your cross to follow Jesus. I remember it, it was some 30 years ago now that we were called to Scotland. <laughs> That's incredible, really. I didn't realise I was that old. Anyway. And um, that was pretty inconvenient. Especially as after we'd been in Scotland five years, I was, I was up on the, the, the Isles of Shetland talking to, to a couple of some of the churches in, in, in the Shetland Islands. And uh, I got a phone call from my pal who led a church in Guernsey, that, and he was being called away from Guernsey. And he said, Keith, I would really, I, I, I'm, I'm moving on to, to, he was going to get involved in missionary work in, in the Philippines. He said, I'm being called on to other things, to, but I've, I would really like you to come and pastor the church in Guernsey. Scotland, Guernsey. I'm a sun worshipper, by the way. Becky's not. But, but do, do, do you know, the, te the temptation was there. But we knew. We knew that God had called us to Scotland. Take up your cross daily and follow him. That's what discipleship's about. It's not that one-off experience. It's a daily choice to follow Jesus. And you know, it really isn't easy. And anybody that tells you it is, is doing you a massive disservice. And I guess one of the advantages of being old is that you get to look back on your life and you gain some perspective. And I have to tell you this morning that being a Christian has been really, really hard. There are times when God has asked things of me that I haven't wanted to do and there are times when I haven't always been obedient. There are times when I have suffered pain and loss. It's been heartbreaking seeing people you love walk away from the faith. It's been heartbreaking seeing churches split. It's been heartbreaking seeing people die prematurely. It's been heartbreaking seeing prayers not answered. It's not been easy. It is not easy. But I made a decision to daily take up my cross. And I haven't always succeeded in that. But that's my heart. That's the perspective. And do you know, I don't think there is any other way to live. John Ortworth, again, another time when Pete, Peter messed up, has got that fabulous title of, of his book, hasn't he? If you want to walk on water, get out of the boat. And of course, with every preacher I've heard always focuses on Peter's losing faith and beginning to sink and crying out to Jesus for help, and of course Jesus rescues him. 
But John Ortberg makes the point that actually Jesus <laughs> was the only one that walked on water. For those few moments, he walked on water. It really isn't easy. But I know this. He will never leave you or give up on you. And he will always want to use you. Make that choice today to keep following Jesus. Make that choice today to pick up your cross. Can we have a time of quiet? As we just picture Jesus in obedience, traveling from Jericho, 800 miles below sea level, to Jerusalem, higher than Ben Lomond, 3,000 feet above sea level. Knowing that he was going to face death, but doing so in obedience to his father. What an example. What is Jesus asking of you today? Is there something that you are not being obedient to? Just in the quietness of your own heart now, just make that commitment. to step out in faith and to be obedient to whatever it is he asks you. What does it look like for you to follow Jesus on Monday when you go to work or at home or wherever you are on Monday morning? What does that look like? Holy Spirit, you know how weak and fickle we are and how often we just get pulled along by the crowds. Help us now in this moment to make that decision to take up our cross and to continue following you daily. Help us to be those that don't just talk a good talk but step out into obedience and follow you daily. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the band could 